So while Jaya, you talked about it's going to take a long time, uh, which is fair, and Shika, you also talked about some of the uh, momentum, but it's still slow. If you look out 10 years, and the question is for both of you, do you think, given the undercurrents of what you see as a business, your opportunity is 3x, 5x if consumers come along? I mean, how, how do you see your business? Are you excited about, hey, banking can finally get much bigger, my, my revenue growth can be faster, my profitability can be higher? Forget startups, forget everything, just as a bank. So that's what I was trying to allude to, that uh, why there's all the worry about what is all of this innovation going to do to its numbers. We are really excited about the So, uh, as I said, I didn't have that on the slides, but we looked at the shift of informal to formal, which uh, the friends were rooted for the urban and And uh, I think, if I remember right, it's, it went from 70, 30, 30, 30. That's informal form. So there was a complete switch that happened in the decade. Uh, now, if we look at two markets, which are currently not accessed by banks, then of course it's the rural markets, but it's also the very small markets. Because uh, they're not good at accounting, we, you know, as bankers, we are right based on balance sheets, we have no access to balance sheets. So it's very hard for us to let go of people. And uh, the more that they digitize, the more we have access to that digital information, I think it's going to change, and it's going to change dramatically. So as I look at opportunities for us, I think that's a big new market that opens up. And uh, I think it's also a big opportunity for us to partner with TechStar. Because the models to succeed there, the kind of infrastructure that you need to succeed there, is going to be kind of different from what banks are doing today. Uh, we try to work with a couple of new tech companies in that area, but I think it's very early in some really exciting stuff that, that can be done. Yeah. The financial sector usually grows one and a half times of the, of the GDP, but I want to take a slightly different way <coughs> that, uh, you know, we also have to focus on the real sector and the government. There is a data that says that out of every 100 people in Andhra Pradesh, 75 access digital format of interacting with the government. The same is three in Bihar. So those kinds of stuff has to be done. And when I went once to Korea, and it was a long time back, 2006, to do an audit, I asked the mortgage person, I mean, what is your income? How do you measure it? He said, we don't take income and record it all in the bank. Then I asked him, what about property valuation and title? That we don't know that either. So then I asked, how are we actually lending? How are you actually lending? And it is interesting because Korean society is fairly structured, I think. They had everything automated. So they could say through a connection with the insurance, national insurance uh, bureau, what is the salary of the customer? And it all has to happen in, in milliseconds. The title could be checked again in the same manner. So the enabling environment in terms of government records, various other things. And keeping the ticket sizes in mind, the productivity in Korea, it looked to me that the cost of processing a transaction in Korea was actually cheaper than what it was in Bombay. So I think the necessity to make things cheaper, affordable, faster would also require a fair amount of working with the government in doing it. Today, if you had a look at the government land recording, it takes months to complete the type of search and other things. So I think the necessity to work with the government and getting those things the real sector also kind of brought in also. And, and how about, sorry, go ahead. Just one piece of data I want to share here, actually. We, uh, one segment that as a bank we didn't cater to when we got into about two years ago was microfinance. Of course, we were doing microfinance earlier by lending to microfinance companies, but two years ago we decided to go directly to the customer. And uh, about a year ago, we decided to do that end-to-end uh, -end payment. So it's completely digital when we acquire a customer service a customer. And these are people who are taking loans of 12 to 18,000 in the first round, and maybe 24 to 30,000 in the second round. And what's exciting to us is that we've enrolled a 1.3 million customers on this purely paperless small tickets. And um, 
as Jay Kumar was saying, some of that infrastructure has come, come into play. So you do have bureau data for that end of the market available today. And you have Aadhaar, so a lot of them have Aadhaar and on board them biometrically. And uh, it's interesting to see the take-up rate. And I went recently to uh, one of the villages outside the north, which was one of the earlier villages we started. And it is so heartwarming to see what that enablement can do for people. So we've had some incredible successful stories about micro-entrepreneurship coming from being able to do that. So uh, I think this will happen fast. So, so while, while you're on that, let me ask a question. We have a, a lot of investors here uh, from abroad. Uh, we've got startups, uh, we've got executives. The, the one question at the back of everybody's mind is, you know, how do you actually make money? So for example, uh, you know, let's say we have 500 million bank accounts and today the people who, who are in the top 30% who have access to an access or a Bank of Baroda bank account, there is a standard set of products you sell to them, you know how, where the spreads are, you make money. But the example you gave of the, uh, you, you, you know, the, the, the kind of shopkeeper or anything you have, both from a startup standpoint or for a bank, are we talking about imagining new products at new price points and new margins, or do you believe standard products work and you're just looking for onboarding and access? So the way we've done this so far, and maybe it's uh, an incumbent strategy and a new player strategy might be completely different, but we have primarily taken existing products and digitized them. So it's not that we've come with brand new products to that market, but we've come with brand new delivery methods. Uh, and, uh, you know, so uh, in this paperless stuff that we're talking about, what we do is we go into a geomapping of the village, so we know where the people, we've actually seen the records. Uh, we then go and do an education exercise once off of a templated mobile-led delivery mechanism. So, you know, you cut down on the cost of training the individual who's delivering the training. And thereafter, you, you, you know, get the ladies who are interested to come together as a group and do biometric acquisition. And then you're doing all the delivery of the services digitally as well. So you're actually cutting the cost to service dramatically. Uh, is the product very different? No, it's still a short-term microfinance loan which could get paid in 18 months or 24 months. But the way you are promoting it and the way you're delivering it and servicing, it is radically different. Uh, are we now, having got that experience, thinking about other new products that we can develop? Certainly we are. So, you know, one of the products that we have is something called uh, Kartpa, which is to uh, these merchants looking at the digital pattern of transaction and giving them short-term credit. Once you can do paperless, the big thing you can do differently is that we can make money off of an 18-month loan, because you're going to have to be on it for 18 months. How am I going to make money off of a one-month loan? How am I going to make money off of a 10-day loan? That's the big challenge. And it's only if I can bring down the cost of transaction dramatically that I can start to do that. And that's what opens up a new market, which is today being served by the and which we are just not able to cater to because the cost of the business would be humongous. Just switching, just related but slightly different topic. I mean, a lot of our companies uh, across the board who are non in the non-financial sector, whether it's power supplies, furniture, grocery, everybody fundamentally has a credit problem at some level to even scale their business because their consumers have it or their suppliers have it. Maybe you can talk a little bit about lending in India in the context of these changes and how do you see that changing? Do you think, you know, we are at a stage where you have the ability to solve for some of the, uh, you, you know, the significant demand and lack of supply uh, actual transactions on the lending side for small businesses. Okay, I'll, I'll try to slightly take a different tack and cover things that don't overlap with what Shika is saying. Uh, so one of the things uh, that we obviously are seeing uh, is that more information. And when you do lend to small businesses, you know whether the inventory is there or the data exists. Now on hopes of the GST and the automation, one can establish that and therefore there is a greater level of confidence to do the transaction. Plus a more automated monitoring process as opposed to being, you know, 
on the ground which has a large amount of failure. That's one aspect. The second thing I'm be looking forward is the market itself expanding, not so much in borrowing, but the ability to sell down the loans in various formats through an electronic exchange would bring in new players to the funding side and that would drive down the cost of borrowing or at least give the customer a method to optimize it. So we have to look at it from a multiple perspective. I would also tend to look at the cost of money and how that could be made easier and also how the bank can de-risk itself by bringing in more number of players and therefore I would say to the fintech companies look on both sides. There's an opportunity, there's a large opportunity. And uh, just to switch gears a little bit, uh, I mean, there are a lot of young uh, CEOs in the audience. Uh, I had a question on uh, demonetization for you as leaders in your company. I mean, I'm assuming if you wanted an example of a black swan event, hopefully this was one. Uh, how did you deal with it? I mean, uh, the first day and the first week and uh, how, how, how did you as an individual, as a leader, deal with an event that you can't expect and what were your initial reactions and anything from that that the audience can, can take away as, as young leaders in their, their companies? So yeah, I certainly think it was, for me, the big black swan event in my career because we had, uh, you know, we got to hear the announcement along with everybody at, uh, at 8 p.m. And uh, 48 hours later, what banks were required to do was to remove the old currency and stop the ATM with the new currency and open doors for business 48 hours down the line with a whole lot of new business rules in place. And that was okay, 48 hours down the line. But after that, uh, I think there were more than 100 policy changes that came in the next 28 days, and uh, our IT systems were expected to make those changes and make them live. Now, uh, the way banks are set up, you don't make IT changes and roll them out in 24 hours. You don't get killed if you do that. You, you have to kind of go through compliance, you have to do your specs, you have to do your user testing, you have to do your cyber security, and you roll it out on the outside. So we just had to do business a whole new way which we had never done before. And uh, so you kind of take a leap of faith and say, okay, I'm going to do this, and maybe some things won't turn out right, but you still have to do that, because that's the way to move forward. And what we focused on very much, and I think different banks may focus on different things, depending on what their ethos was, but Axis, uh, much before I joined, it has always been known for being very customer service oriented. So uh, the first thing that came top of our mind uh, for all of us was how are we going to make sure that we make the customer experience as seamless as possible in the way we do this. And so we thought about new management, we thought about separate lines for senior citizens, we thought about making sure there was water managed queues, making sure we were in touch with the local police to manage queues. Because the biggest worry that we had really uh, on that first moment when we heard that was are we going to have a law and order problem 48 hours later when the shop opens? Because people are just going to be uh, totally panicked about what to do with that old currency. And uh, what we learned actually was pretty amazing that we did have law and order problems, but very isolated. So uh, customers were pretty understanding. And um, I think because our whole ethos was about service, we were actually able to have conversations with customers and kind of keep it calm. So we didn't have long queues, but we didn't have law and order issues. But uh, were we ready with all the automation and all the systems and, it, and did some of that crack? It did. And uh, I think that's where uh, the challenges are. And I don't know whether we would have gone and done anything very different if I were to go back and do these two months again. Because as I said, again, it's about the ethos of the organization. And if proactive service comes first, and um, two things stand out. One, the resilience of the employees and then the resilience of the common man. Both of this kind of worked in harmony to make this whole demonetization process happen. I've received so many letters from so many people saying, you know, this particular branch, they stayed late, they made sure 
And in a system where probably you don't associate too much with service, when I'm talking about public sector banks in general, uh, I, this was a period when they actually rose to the occasion. And then we of course had some mechanisms of transferring success, recognizing people, celebrating them and all of that stuff. But I think that was something that was that came quite naturally, I will say so. The second thing, of course, as Shika was saying, the worry about law and order and all of this stuff. But the consumers also came along quite nicely, waiting in the lines. <coughs> and, uh, you know, subject, subjecting them to some disciplines and not complaining too much and saying in a very understanding way, yes, this needs to be done because this is good for the country. Now, we may have had isolated issues, but I thought that was quite remarkable. That's great to hear. So, so let me ask you a question that we as investors ponder a lot, um, but I'll preface it a little bit. Look, in India, the, the, the basic thing is, you know, the mobile phones become the center of it. This morning I was having a conversation with one of our LPs and we were discussing the difference between the mobile phone and the Western in India. In India, it is very much a way of life where if you're a cab driver, you're a grocery guy or anybody, the mobile phone often drives your revenue and your income more so than the West. And it looks like the consumer is well ahead uh, in terms of understanding this and usage compared to even five years ago from a movie to, you know, rail tickets to so on and so forth. So if you were to look out 10 years, right, and what does the bank of the future look like, right, irrespective of what we think 18 months, 24 months, is it a combination of a bank like Axis or Bank of Baroda with an internet platform? Is it a digital only bank that you become? Is it, you know, a fintech startup that somehow that has 100 million users suddenly acquires a bank? I mean, how, What's your best guess at what the world looks like in so this space? Uh, ownership, uh, well, I would uh, be scared to predict because uh, I think some of the incumbents will benefit and grow. I think some of the new players will win as well. So uh, who exactly will succeed and what will the structure of the market look like 10 years from now is hard to predict. But uh, what I would bet is that we're going to have massive amounts of digitization. And we're going to have customers do stuff on digital, which they don't do on digital today. But uh, but I'm not ruling out the relevance of that. I think uh, when something goes wrong, customers still want the comfort of a physical person they can go talk to. So one of the things that we would never do is put a robot in the branch. Uh, I think that doesn't make sense because customers will do stuff digitally and then when things don't work, then they want to come and speak to a person and they want to get trust and comfort from the person. So I think it is going to be a combination of digital and branches and whoever does that best and uh, whoever actually delivers the promise of uh, convenience and trust to the customer and value, uh, is going to win. And uh, who knows, it could be a fintech that takes over a bank. It could be a bank who adopts digital smartly and delivers the customer promise. I think it's going to be oh. Okay, That's great. Jay? Uh, ten years too long to Five years. think about everything. But let me tell you this way. Uh, as, I, as we think about technology, uh, it is not about depersonalizing service. It is rather about giving the customer choices to interact in whatever medium they choose to interact with. So the branches are there, the mobile phones are there, the call centers are there, you know, the kiosks are there, everything else is there. And we'll see how consumers prefer what, but give them the choices to do what they want. Now coming down to the vulnerability aspect of it, I think public sector banks as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a group, leaving aside SBI, do face severe vulnerability issues at this point in time. And in the next two years, our ability to get to a digital, digitize ourselves, go up the, you know, reduce the competitive gap and provide similar optionalities to customers is going to be very critical. And that's what I worry about. And I'll ask the last question, um, since there are, I know there are a bunch of uh, startups here as well. If you had to pick one or two areas where, you know, you would tell your team, if I found external innovation can solve this problem for me today or within the next year, what would they be and uh, how do you think about that? Top of the mind, cybersecurity. So uh, whoever can give us the most savvy, most forward-looking cybersecurity solutions, I think we would love to partner. 
and uh, the second is uh, whoever gives us new uh, information pathway access. Because data, you know, as the economy goes digital and the government goes digital, uh, Jekumar referred to some of the stuff around land records, there's just going to be so much data available out there which uh, we may or may not be able to process. Today, a lot of our underwriting and our decisions are based on our own transaction data. And till today, we find that that's the biggest differentiator as far as uh, client policy is concerned. But I think in 10 years, that's going to change dramatically. So I think our own transaction data is, of course, going to be important. But I think it's going to be one of the elements of performance. And there'll be a lot more data out there that we can use to make smarter decisions for us as a bank and for customers in terms of their choice of products and services. So uh, those are the two areas we have set for cybersecurity and information pathway. That's great. <laughs> I think Shika said it for us, it's about people with whom we can work to make smarter decisions. And there are so many gaps that, and there are so many opportunities that are coming in. One tends to think, let us make a thousand flowers bloom, kind of an approach. But specifically for us, I think the critical areas would be two things. One, analytics platform, particularly the ability to use transactional data. We have a combination of an extremely large customer base, but one that is absolutely underexploited. And so that anybody working on that area, in whatever way you call it, big data, <laughs> transactional, you know, crunching, whatever it is, that would be, uh, I think, uh, would be very interesting. The second thing for us would be uh, partnering where the customer proposition tends to increase substantially. And we have a few examples of that. I don't want to get into the details. But in principle, if there is a way to work with FinTech, who come to us and then increase the value of the customer proposition such that, you know, both benefit, that's an area we should really think about. Great. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, let's give them a big hand. Thanks.